There's a tendency when you hear the word jhana to think of some otherworldly state. Something far removed from the mind as you're experiencing it right now. But what is it made out of? In the passes we chanted just now from the analysis of the path, there's direct a thought, evaluation. This pleasure and rapture. And what makes these faculties different from your ordinary directed thought and evaluation and feelings of pleasure, and sometimes of rapture, is that you're bringing them together to one thing. But you're taking habits, abilities, tendencies that you already have. So it's not so otherworldly after all. But what it means is you've got to take the habits you have and you've got to change them. Like direct a thought and evaluation. That's the Buddha's analysis for our way of talking to ourselves. And then, of course, we break into speech. We have comments on this, comments on that. And what we're trying to do is learn how to take the language of our comments the way we frame issues, how we direct our thoughts, and the ways in which we evaluate things, and make them more skillful. This is one of the reasons why right speech is a factor of the path, because it's going to give you practice and how to talk to yourself. Both right speech and right concentration are very directly connected to right resolve. The resolve to practice for renunciation, in other words, stay away from sensuality, for non-ill will, and for harmlessness, in other words, for, for good will and for, for compassion. And from right resolve that in one direction it goes to right speech, trying to make sure that your speech is compassionate, the Buddha asks. Let it be true, let it be beneficial, and let it be timely. You've got to keep careful watch over your speech. For so many of us, speech is like a faucet. You're not really sure what's inside the faucet, so you turn it on to see what's going to come out. But as the Buddha taught Rola, you have to think before you speak. When I say this, what is the results going to be? Is it going to be harmful? Is it going to be harmful for the community, harmful to the person who I'm talking to, harmful for myself? We have this fascination with our opinions. And we think that intelligence is measured by how many opinions we can have. But when you come to the practice of the Dharma, you have to realize you have to think of intelligence in another way. Intelligence in terms of seeing where your thoughts are coming from, where your words are coming from, and where they're going to go, what they lead to, and realizing that what may seem like a really great thought or something that someone else has to hear. may not be so intelligent after all, in the terms that the Buddha applies. Or it may be a good thing to say, but maybe right now is not the time to say it. You have to think about these things, because you've got to get this process of direct thought and evaluation under control, if it actually is going to become a factor of jhana, because that's the other factor that branches right out of right resolve. The Buddha has a definition for transcendent right resolve. And it basically comes down to the direct thought and evaluation that gets you into jhana. Again, it's based on renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness. This is more directly focused inside. 
but the way you deal with other people is going to have an impact on how you talk to yourself, the way you talk to them, the kinds of things you think about, the ways you comment on things. That's going to have an impact on the way you talk to yourself, direct your thoughts, and evaluate things as you're sitting here with your eyes closed. So it's good to be very careful about your speech. And when the time comes to settle down and you're ready to focus on the breath, you've got these processes trained. So they will look at what actually is going on. The things you say to yourself are true and beneficial and timely. It becomes simply a matter of focusing on your breath and learning how to talk to yourself about the breath. And I get too wound up in thoughts about how things are not settling down as quickly as I'd like, especially not the thoughts that go from there to say, well, maybe I'm just a miserable meditator and I'm never, this is never, never going to happen. Just forget about that. That's framing your directed thoughts and evaluation in the wrong way. If anything, you just remind yourself this is something that can be done. This takes a different kind of intelligence, not smarts intelligence, but it takes intelligence of noticing what kind of breathing is good and what kind of effects it's going to have on the body, the effects it's going to have on the mind. And really giving yourself over to this issue. How can I get the mind to stay with the breath? How can I get the breath to act as a glue to keep the body with the mind right here in the present moment? How can I learn how to question the breath in a way that makes it interesting? If you have any recurring illnesses or injuries, see what the breath can do for those. If there's a part of the body that tends to be tight where things are pulled out of alignment, can you breathe in ways and conceive of the breath in ways that it actually helps bring things back into alignment? And what about the breath energies that John Lee talks about, the ones that surround the body, not just the ones in the body, but all around? How do you sense those? How do you get use out of them? Because that's the whole point of this. You want to make this conversation inside beneficial. But where does this internal conversation come from? It comes from your tendency to talk to yourself and then break into speech with others. It's important to realize that as we practice, we are building on habits we already have, using things that we've already been using, like the aggregates. As the Buddha says, when the mind gets settled in, then you get really good at this. You start analyzing the state of concentration in terms of those five aggregates. And we all know that they're in constant stressful, not self. But for the sake of the concentration, you're going to make them more constant, easeful, more under your control. Now, they can't become totally easeful. After all, if they were totally easeful, it would be nirvana. And there will be some stress in there. In fact, one of the big insights is once you've gotten used to really appreciating the pleasure of a concentrated mind, it's coming around to the fact that, yeah, even here there are some ups and downs. There's some inconstancy. Even this is imperfect. That's how you can go beyond it, which is one of the reasons when the Buddha talked about taking the raft across the river, he used the image of a raft and not the image of a yacht. You take twigs and sticks and leaves and branches, and you tie them together with vines. In other words, what you can find on this shore It may not look all that pretty, it may not be all that perfect, but it's good enough to get you across. If you have to wait until everything is nicely planed and beautifully fitted, and 
the Buddha's image, there are snakes and vipers and thieves after you on this side of the river. You've got to get out of there. So you take what you've got. In this case, it's simply the way the mind talks to itself. Well, you learn how to talk yourself into jhana. And even though the jhana is made out of aggregates, and the aggregates are in constant stress, well, not self on a very subtle level, still are good enough to get you across. So the raw materials may not be perfect, but you do try to get the twigs that will float. The branches that will float. You don't want to build a raft that's going to sink down into the bottom of the river. In other words, you've got to learn how to be more skillful in your the habits you already have, both on an external level and on an internal level. But what it comes down to is just the mind talking to itself until it gets to a point of equilibrium where it doesn't really feel any need to talk to itself anymore. That's when you can go into deeper levels of concentration. But to lasso the mind into the present moment, it's going to require some talking, internal talking. So develop good habits in your external speech. Have a clear sense of what's the right time and place, what's true, what's not true, what's beneficial, what's not beneficial. Of all the qualities of right speech. And those qualities then will carry over into internal right speech that can get the mind to settle down. So when the mind is concentrated, there's still you in there. But it's a you that's been trained. So take all aspects of the training seriously. When the Buddha set up the Eightfold Path, he didn't choose eight factors because he liked the number eight. These were the factors that were all necessary. So make sure you've got them all covered.